So we've been talking about covered. Everybody say covered. We've been talking about building a house, and so we're at the final part because if anybody builds the roof and throws the roof on before the rest of the house, well, you know, you might want to look at the credentials of your builder. It's kind of one of the, the, the things that, that we want to make sure. Well, we're going to talk about it. The last thing is the roof. Everybody say the roof. And so we're talking about covering. And so what I want to talk to you for a minute is about sin. How many of you have ever sinned? How many of you can remember the sin you did? How many of you still feel sometimes the emotion of the sin that you did? Yeah. I think if we're honest, we could all say that sin is a pretty, has a pretty powerful bite. Matter of fact, the Bible would compare sin to the bite of an adder, which is one of the most venomous snakes in the world. It bites you, and you can, you can ignore it for a minute, but that venom gets into your system, and it pipes itself all through your vital organs and all through your body, and it, 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 eventually, it shuts your body down. And, and so sin, you, you may not know this. I don't preach a whole lot about it. We don't talk a whole lot about it. But let me talk about it for just a minute. Sin is invincible. Sin cannot be stopped. That's why you struggle so much to overcome the things you do. I do too. We struggle to overcome those things because we want to act like sin isn't powerful. But it's powerful. Sin is strong. It's strong. How many, well, I'm not going to leave that alone, but how many of you know that you have a sin that you struggle with? It doesn't matter how we want to color that sin. How many know there's acceptable sins to us? There's some acceptable sins. There's some non-acceptable sins, but it doesn't change the fact that they're sin. We walked in the building today, and, and Junior started smelling something funny. He didn't say nothing, but then Robert comes in the building. He goes, Pastor, are you smoking pot? I said, before service or after service? <laughs> right? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I can smell it. I said, bro, I just smelled the strawberries. What are you talking about? Well, there was something over here, something over here that was uh, putting out a certain smell that they thought that was pot. But being that I'm holy and never smoked pot in my life or been around any of that, I wouldn't know any of that. But these two sinners that were with me... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. You, you Listen, this is not the day you want to mess with pastor. You should have been right today, right? So here's, here's, here's my point. My, my point is that some of you are struggling with sin because we make it acceptable. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what laws are passed for alcohol. It doesn't matter what laws are passed for um, marijuana. Are you ready? It doesn't matter that you can, for 99 cents, biggie size and king size your order at McDonald's. All those sins are unacceptable to the Lord, and they're the same. Whether we're overeating, whether we're indulging in alcohol, whether we're engaged in marijuana, whether we're engaged in illicit sex, whether you're watching somebody else have sex or you're having sex with somebody you should be having sex with, all those are addictive. They're addictive, and you can look at somebody and go, yeah, I can't believe you do that, but you have your sin that you're dealing with. And here's the thing about sin. Let's just be honest. It's invincible. If you could conquer it on your own, you would conquer it. If you could get over it on your own, you would get over it. But we couldn't. As a humanity, as a, as a race of humans, we couldn't conquer sin. So then Jesus makes a plan because he knew this when Adam and Eve in the garden sinned. Jesus immediately came up with a plan. And the plan was this. Go grab a, actually, Jesus went and he grabbed a lamb and he sacrificed that lamb. In the garden, and he took that lamb and he covered the sins of Adam and Eve. He literally covered them. The blood was shed, and he covered them. Somebody say covered. There was a problem with this mechanism that existed for almost 5,000 years, maybe a little bit longer. This mechanism was blood covering, but it was not forgiving. So sin always had a presence, even though, watch this, even though, uh, you remember the story, you remember the story in Luke 16 when Jesus was talking uh, uh, to this man, and he said, I'm going to tell you a parable of a rich man and a poor man. Remember that? And he said they both died, but the rich man went to Hades, which is a boat of the wicked dead. But the one who, um, uh, who, who was loving God, he went to uh, Sheol, excuse me, the other way around. Uh, they were both in hell two different parts of hell, one separate, separated by a chasm. 
a chasm. So in other words, before Jesus came, your sin would only be covered, not forgiven. So where you went when you died and everybody who died before Jesus, they didn't go to heaven. They went to hell. They were just like in the green room of hell. Abraham's bosom. Thank you very much. Right? They went to Abraham's bosom, not hell, because their sins were covered but not forgiven. Then later on, 5,000 years later, fast forward, Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus comes on the scene, and I love this about the master. Well, he's on the cross, and his blood is being shed. He hadn't even finished the project yet. But his blood was being shed, and the thief on the side of him looked at him, and he said, hey, listen, when you get there, would you remember me? And Jesus looked at him, and he said, I'm building a spot, son. And today, you will be with me in paradise. For the first time in the existence of humanity, we went from having our sins covered to being covered and forgiven of every part of our sin. If you want to build a life that's going to last, you better understand that there is power in your words, that there is power in the church, that there is power in the world, and that there is power in sin. But humanity has never seen a force greater than the power of the sacrifice lamb of Jesus Christ. There is power in the blood of Jesus. And the church don't talk a whole lot about it, but I shared with you sometime when we were young, Dolores. We were young and we would see things. Oppression would come. Challenges would come. And the old saints would get around their children and get around each other. And they would call one thing. They would say, Father, uh, we apply the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood. We sang about the blood. We preached about the blood. We talked about the blood. Because from then till today and until the coming back of the Lord Jesus Christ, there only exists one strength and one force that can change a man's life forever. And that's the blood of Jesus. Somebody shout the blood. Come on, shout the blood. If you've ever been delivered, shout the blood. If you've ever been forgiven, shout the blood. If you're grateful for your salvation, shout the blood. And I, I know there's a lot of cool uh, uh, sermons out there and there's a lot of there's a lot of pretty things and I've done my best to lay this out for you in a real cool way but I gotta tell you something man when it comes down to what matters you gotta reach back to the things that you know and at the end of the day the blood heals the blood delivers the blood restores listen when somebody is sick they give them a blood transfusion the first thing they want to check when you go out there is how's your blood doing are you feeling anemic in life how's the blood in you are you feeling struggling in your relationship How's the blood in you? Maybe you're checking the wrong stuff. Stop checking on what your neighbor's doing. Stop checking the stock market. Why don't you put some Holy Ghost time aside and say, Lord, we apply the blood. We apply the blood. We apply the blood. Apply the blood over our life. I think if you want a life that's going to last, thank God for the books. Pick up the blood. Thank God for the teachings. Pick up the blood. I'm not talking to anybody here today. One drop of Jesus' blood changed the world. One drop. Look at someone say one drop. One drop. For the next 10 minutes that I have left, I want to let you know what the blood of Jesus made available to you and I. If you have your notes and you're following along, because of the blood, we now have a covenant life. So let me say covenant life. A lot of you don't really know what the word of covenant means, but I'm going to break it down in two forms for you. Number one, the word covenant is how the Lord expresses himself. It's how the Lord wants you to know him. So when God makes a covenant, he's revealing his nature to you and I. Does that make sense? And here's what he does in the book of Genesis. He begins to tell Abraham the plans that he has for him. Abraham, this is how I want you to live. This is what I have for you. I'm going to make your children like the stars in the sky. I'm going to bless you to such a degree that the world will be blessed through you. All the families of the earth will be blessed. This is what God is saying to Abraham in a covenant. Somebody say covenant. 
Now, if I can use a modern term to express this word covenant of which Jesus is talking about or God is talking about with Abraham, the word would be promise. Promise. In other words, God is recognizable. God is defined by his promises. Now, this doesn't mean a whole lot to you yet, but let me bring it home to you. How many of you paid off your home? You're debt-free on your home. Anybody here? Awesome. How many of you are debt-free on your automobiles? Awesome. Awesome. How many of you went to the bank when you tried to buy your house and they wouldn't give you a loan? (laughs) Come on. Come on, some of you ain't going to raise your hand because you're like, I don't want nobody to know. Nobody to know. You know why they didn't give you a loan? Two reasons. Your debt or your credit score. You're getting a banking lesson right now. Nothing to do with banking. You know what your credit score is made out of? Here it is. I'm going to give it to you in real simple terms. Your ability to keep your Promise. I promise you, Mr. GMAC, that if you give me $25,000 so that I can buy this truck, I'm going to give you $400 a month. That's a promise. I promise, Mr. GMAC, that if, I, if you give me $200,000 to buy my house, I'm going to give you $1,200 a month. It's a promise. When you don't keep your promise, your credit score drops. And, and you're not going to believe this, but they make it harder for you to get money. The lower your credit score goes, the harder it is. You would think, hey, give me the low interest rate. I need the help. I don't make as much money as this person. But that's not how the world works. And so God wants you to know this about him. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. But if God said it, you can put, you can put it in the bank. God wants you to know that he's a God of promise, and he's going to keep his promises for, for you and I. So let me just put this out to you, okay? How many of you have got family members who are astray? If you've got family members who are astray, then you need to get to the blood and have access to this promise, which is this. You and your whole household will be saved. Take that to the bank. That's the promise of God in your life. That makes sense? You have a covenant life, and that's a life of promise. Start accessing the promises of God. I had about 10 more promises that I wanted to go through, but they're in there. You know what they are. Stop living like they're not there. Listen, at the end of the day, you choose every week whether or not you're going to keep your promise. God made up his mind 2,000 years ago. Before you even, but Pastor, I made a mistake. Before you messed up, God decided to be faithful to his promises to you. You don't have to earn them. I'm getting ahead of myself. It was a covenant life. Covenant life. Covenant life is God is not only going to promise you, but he's going to show himself strong through your promise, through his promise. Number two, here's what we have under the blood. We have a life of grace. We have a life of grace. Somebody say grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Somebody say a gift. Grace is such a big subject to cover it in three and a half minutes would be ridiculous. But I want to say this to you. You didn't earn it. And because you didn't earn it, you can't lose it the way other people tell you you can lose it. I always heard, it's the truth, right? Is I always heard that if somebody made a mistake, you fall from grace. Now that I understand scripture, here's what the Bible says. When you make a mistake, you fall into grace. You don't fall from grace, you fall into grace. Pastor Eli, what are you saying? What I'm saying is for those of us who are striving to serve God, and and I love this because because motive nobody knows but you. Nobody knows but you. And, And people can judge your motive, but you know your motive. And if you want to lie about your motive, you can. But who's going to reap that reward? Not me. I don't have to deal with a lying individual. I don't have to deal with a cheating individual. I have to deal with my choices. And I'm not going to live on God's grace and go, oh, I'm going to sin anyway because God got grace. If you have that mentality, my friend, you're already going down the wrong track, right? So I'm not going to stay there anymore. I used to preach that art till the cows came home. You can't take advantage of God's grace. You can't keep advantage of God's grace. And that's because the people I, I was around always wanted to sin. You know what? If you want to sin, go sin. Go knock yourself out. Go see what the world has. I promise you it won't be long before you go. Like my wife says, hey, if you ever wanted my husband, you'd have him back on my doorstep in three days. People, people see 
the preacher, they don't understand the person, right? You see the limelight of sin, but you don't see the pain of it. Come on, we see the, the, uh, the highlights of sin, but you don't see the devastation of it. It's devastating. Somebody say devastating. So here's what I'm saying to you today. Live by grace. Did you make a mistake? Get back up. Did you fall? Get back up. Did life throw you a curveball? Get back in the batter's box and keep your eye on that ball because the next swing you're going to take is going to be out of the park. Why, Pastor? Because I live a life of grace. God's been good to me. And now I'm going to be good to everybody else. My wife, and, and not my wife, but a lot of people often say, Eli, why are you so forgiving to people? Because you don't know what a sinner I am. I get one amen. Normally, Bernie would take that moment and go, Sean did he? He must be out. Right? Are you tracking me? Listen, you, I, I, I give grace because God's given me grace. And if we live a life by grace, why wouldn't we give a life? By grace. You know, I, my relationships get sweeter and sweeter with my wife the more grace I apply. I don't always want to apply grace. Nick, sometimes I want to apply a little foot stomping, you know. I'm the man in this house. You ever get one of those feelings? I'm the man in this house. I must be the only one. Because some of you ladies get that same feeling. I'm the man in this house. <laughs> I'm quiet in this great Baptist house today. You know exactly what I'm talking about. What I'm saying to you is simply this, life is better when we live by grace. We can live by grace because God forgave us by grace. I can't do it, Pastor. I just can't do it. Why not? God did it for you. You accepted that grace. If God forgave you and you're living under grace, why can't you extend grace to the person, to the neighbor, to the co-worker? Come on, somebody. Some of you, and I feel this by the Spirit right now, some of you have family members you're mad at. And the truth is you may be right. But if God forgave you when you were wrong, why wouldn't you forgive them when they were wrong? Receive grace. Give grace. Fall down. Get back up. Get wounded. Choose to heal even when you're wounded. Tracking with me? Okay. Last one, last one. Because of the blood, I have a covenant life. Because of the blood, I have a grace life. And here's number three. Because of the blood, I have hope for the life to come. I have hope for the life to come. Can I read you this scripture? There is more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, I would have told you that. I would not have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. Look at somebody say, God's going to prepare a place for you. Hebrews 11.6, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Part of the struggle in the life we live today is that we put more value on this life than the life to come. And I'm going to tell you, man, I want everything God has for me in this life. I want it all, Todd. I want everything that God has for me. But I don't want anything in this life to jeopardize my status in the life to come. Sometimes we forget that this life is momentary. It's a flash. Your 80 years are here and gone. If you're lucky, you'll make 80. Here and gone. Are you tracking with me? But the life in eternity is going to be forever. So here's the deal. How can you love by grace how can you live and forgive? How can you do that? I can tell you how we can do that. This is not the end game. This is level one. There's so much more beyond this life. And when we don't live conscious of that, then it affects our daily decisions. Why do you sacrifice today? Why do you stay humble today? Why can you smile in the middle of your trial? Because if I lost everything I had today, I got to hope that one day when my eyes are closed in this life, I'm going to be with the Lord forever. And if I'm still alive then one day when the trumpet sounds the Lord is going to split the eastern sky and we're going to go this is not where I'm going to live this is not the end and when you lose focus you lose hope and it's not a, it's not let me calm down it's not a healthy life when you begin to live life and you lose perspective 
of eternity. Somebody say eternity. Pastor, I don't believe in eternity. Okay. You have a real dilemma. I was uh, getting my hair cut the other day. And um, one of the barbers asked me, he goes, hey, Pastor Eli, you guys have a lot of trouble dealing with these subjects, huh? I'll tell you what it was. He goes, you have a lot of trouble dealing with the subject of homosexuality, huh? I said, bro, I don't have any trouble dealing with that subject. He says, what do you mean? I said, it's really simple to me. We love the homosexual. We love them. We welcome them. We embrace them. The problem is with people like you. <laughs> he looked at me and he went. I said, what do you mean? I said, your generation stopped believing in the book. You believe your emotions. You believe your feelings. You believe what radio tells you. You believe what Facebook tells you. You believe everything but the book. And I said, I'm going to tell you, Facebook wasn't here 5, 10 years ago. It's not going to be here 20 years from now if the Lord tarries. You got iPhones that just showed up. I promise you, 15 years from now, you your kids will be like, what's an iPhone? I don't even know what you're talking about. When the iPhone passes, when Apple goes away, when Google disappears, there was a book written 2,000 years ago that is still alive today, and it'll be alive when when Jesus comes back that book my friend is the real answer to the world's problems and that book talks about a home where the streets are made of gold and the gates are made of pearl and forever we will be with the Lord singing Hosanna 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 this is not where we're gonna live it's not where we're gonna live if you lose perspective you lose focus, and life becomes bland, and you get caught up in the same rat race that everybody else is in. How do you stay different? Remember that you're under the blood. Remember that we're under the blood, and we got a covenant, a promise with God. We got a life of grace. Are you ready? We got a home in heaven that's waiting for us all. So treat those people right. Love them the way God loves them. And you'll begin to see something different inside of you. To conclude, Paul said this. He said, don't be earthly minded. Be heavenly minded. When you put heaven as a priority in your life, you have a life that's built to last.